that God had me there, shaped me, and prepared me for what I'm doing now. And I believe that the same is true for you. Everything that you're, every strength, every struggle, every high, every low is shaping you. And that he is a God of redemption and nothing will be lost for the kingdom. So I'm going to start with that. And a couple quick things help me here so I get my context. Where are my senior pastors? Senior pastors, just raise your hand. Okay, we have a few. Uh, staff, staff pastors. All right, how many of you are not in a in the process? Okay, so a few of you. All right, Bi uh, bivocational. Let me see your bivocational. Oh, my God. You don't have to, we're like almost 50%. Uh, okay, one more question. Coffee drinkers? Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Wherever you want. 
want me to say, I will say. I just need you to take this because I, I can't figure this thing out. Oh, and by the way, if you'd help me figure out about this Jesus person, that would be good too. <laughs>
get, and then I want church to call me back and said, well, we meet for church at 2, but you can have the church at 10 or 11, if that will work for you. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess. <laughs> we'll make it work. Uh, so anyway, we ended up buying that building, and while we were there, we changed our name to Dot the name of the community. Uh, our vision is to transform our community with the love of Christ by making the neighborhood church relevant once again. And each one of us have our own context. Now, this is our context. We are literally in the middle of a neighborhood. We're kind of like, I uh, think about the old, the city square, the idea, right? So if you get in the middle of the neighborhood, there is this large piece of land in the middle, and we're on, we're on one quarter, and then the, there's an ice rink and a park, and then an empty, empty lot, um, which is actually used to be a school, um, but now they just they tore the school down, so it's just an empty lot right next door to us. And so we're right in the middle of the neighborhood, and everything takes place in that neighborhood, in that little section. And we had to begin to see things from a different perspective and understand our context. Now, each one of us here have our own context. But I want us to look at some scripture today uh, out of Mark's Gospel. Uh, and we're going to use this uh, to build a context. And I'm going to share some stories of, of the ways that we have uh, embraced the scripture and, and adopted it for ourselves as a way that we do outreach and evangelism in our neighborhood, then you'll just, you're just going to have to do the work at some point, right? To try to transfer it or interpret it into your context. Uh, and so the first thing I want to say, though, is outreach and evangelism is part of your DNA. Uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, it's the parable of the sower, you're probably familiar with that. And since I forgot my Bible at home, I have to read it on my phone. <laughs> Just Joanne. Right? I mean, some 
confess sometimes we want to be just, well, you don't want to be just, don't you? I don't <laughs> But it, it's heavy sometimes carrying that title of pastor with all the responsibilities and all. And I can go to work and I can bring up some books and I can put it in a bag and say, you know, I can't say good, God bless you, but I can say, you know, have a nice day and send them off. And so I thought this will be great three months, four months, holiday pay. I get to be just Joanne for a little while. Now, my second day, I learned that nobody works at Barnes and Noble, like that's not their only job. Everybody who works there, they're either in school or this is their second job. So the first thing all your coworkers say to you is, well, where do you work? Like, where's your other job, right? What's your what's your <laughs> real job? And I'm like, I just want to be Joanne. So I said, well, I work in a church. <laughs> 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 And so one of the things that you and I need to be, because I think about in the 
communion of outreach and evangelism that part of our job as ministers of the gospel is to break up the ground, mm -hmm. to remove the rocks, to pull the weeds, and then to plant good soil. So it's four types of soil, the hard path, the rocky places, the thorns and the weeds, and the fertile soil. In this, in this passage, he talks about uh, this. Let me talk about the clock right here, so I'm making sure I'm good. All right, I'm so good. Um, he talks about uh, that the seed is the word. But and I want us to think about because we have uh, in our in our in our 20 over well, 21st century now, but uh, being uh, being this side of the cross, right? We tend to think about uh, the word as being the, the written scripture. But I want us to think about the word in the sense of what I already said to you. John's gospel he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. Right? That Jesus is the word. So when I think about this idea that we're sowing seed, what we're doing is we're sowing Jesus. So not the scriptures as much as we are bringing Christ to the people. And, and, and I think that when we switch our perspective, we shift the way we see things, and we shift and begin to think about us taking Jesus to rather than the scripture to people, then it helps us. It helps us because it becomes personalized. Jesus is a person, not a thing. He is real, flesh and blood, spirit, divine, and that's what the people are hungry for. That's what they're hungry for. So let's suppose that we become intentional about these things. Uh, this is how we start our board meeting, and everyone has to go 
we've seen God at work in the last 30 days, mm -hmm. either in our own lives or the life of the church. Mm -hmm. And everyone is required to bring some kind of a small win to the table. Now, sometimes you and I know that we have to work really hard to pay attention to the small wins because we want to we want to point out the people who are baptized and the people who pray at the altar, right? We want to point out the marriage that was reconciled. But there's a lot that happens before you ever get to that right. point. And, and, and like our kids, by the second or third day, we're getting tired. And there's something about like, sustaining it. Like, we're not even a microwave culture anymore. I used to think of ourselves as being a microwave culture, right? But I watched my husband waiting for his coffee to warm up. And that one minute, he's like, hurry up. Like, we don't, we're not even good with microwave culture. So we have to do some things for ourselves that's going to help to sustain us and our faith community as we move through those frustrating days and sometimes years of ministering. It is, today, outreach and evangelism requires patience, patience, and more patience. <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why I said that every minute at Detroit First prepared me for what I'm doing today. When we walked into, uh, when we walked into uh, this area where we're at, we moved from the Y into this location where we are on Henry Ruff Road. And we've been there for a few months. We decided in the congregation uh, that we were renting from was older and aging and they were closing their doors. <coughs> Uh, we eventually did buy the building from them, and th this is a this is total God thing. I'm gonna share it with you, and hopefully you won't have to go to the altar for being jealous. But we bought 8,500 square feet, two and a half acres, fully furnished building for hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was a total God thing. But those people were so excited. They said, "Here we are." Most of them had been there. They had they had. We had pictures of them shoveling the, that original dirt from when they planted their church. Who came in and said, we're going to help, we're going to finish well, and we're going to help you to reach this community. Yes. One of the things they had been doing, though, was praying for their communities. They said, we've been praying for five years together for God to send families with young children. No, I, I watched them, and they really did pray for that. But we had this really unique thing that outside our, our doors, um, from about where I'm standing to where that wall is, right about that wall, so you that was like our property line, there were 120 kids playing soccer six weeks in the spring and six weeks in the fall, every Saturday, with their parents, because it was only like an hour long, so everybody just stayed. And I would watch them yell at the kids and tell them to get away from the building because they were afraid that these five-year-olds were going to kick the ball through the window. But they kept praying every week for God to send them families with young children. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope they didn't hear that. Here, put that face. <laughs> That's okay. I think they've all been friends now. Uh, they kept praying for this. So, we, so it was the fall time, and they were kicking off their soccer, and we were having our uh, first church work day. Is, uh, it had been so, so long that they just couldn't, uh, they couldn't take care of the property. So we were cleaning up the property. So we got a bunch of lemonade and coffee together, and we took it out to them and set up a table. And, uh, so I went around the room and I just talked to all the parents and said, hey, we just want you to know there's free coffee and lemonade. And if you need to use the bathrooms, we're just doing a work day trying to clean up around here, but it's all free of you. And um, I had we posted a couple people out there because I'm coming out of my outreach and assimilation background, right? Gotta have some people there to chat with people. Um, so we had a couple people out there and nobody would come up to the table. So finally I went out and I said, you know, we just need to leave it there and just come in. And after we, after we had been in the building for about 10, 15 minutes, a couple of them like snuck up to the table and got coffee like they were spiritual schools. And, and nobody would come in and use the bathroom. And we put it out there the second week. And we had to do the same thing. We, we just put it out there. We had to go back in the building. We couldn't even be out there. And they'd come up. A few more people came up. By the end of the six weeks, I think somebody used the bathroom, one person maybe, and we realized 
that we had a lot of work to do in our community. We had ground that was so hard and so beaten down and so broken that they were afraid of the bride of Christ. They were so afraid of us that they wouldn't even use the bathroom. They held it, you know, little five-year-olds. They're like, Mommy, we'll just go home and use the bathroom at home. There's a problem. There's a problem. We look at our church, and somebody doesn't even want to be associated with us long enough to use our rest facility, restroom facilities. We have to say to ourselves, we need to do something. But the first thing we need to do is we need to break up that hard ground. And that's going to be... That's going to take time. That's going to require patience. That's going to be, we let them say some really, really nasty things to us, and we just keep smile, smiling, and we just keep loving them, even though um, they're not treating us very well. Yes. So we did that for six weeks in the fall, and then we did it six weeks in the spring, and then we did it six weeks in the fall. So it took 18 months before anybody ever came up to the after the second, second six weeks, we actually did stand out at the table, but it took 18 months before anyone came up and stood at the table long enough that we could engage them in conversation. And we, we tried, you know, how are you doing? We're doing okay. 18 months before we could ask somebody, how can we pray for you? And I think this is what happened. Uh, kind of like that little plant, right? Um, I said, we would never say to that, we would never say to that, our child, well, it just, it's not like we're going to actually eat that for dinner. Don't be all excited about that. But this is what happens to us, right? We have an event like that. Like, we put the lemonade out that first day, and then the next day, on Sunday, someone will say to us, well, how many people came to church because of that? And, and so sometimes the answer is no. It was the answer was no. Nobody even used our bathrooms. They were not coming to church the next day on Sunday. Uh, the answer is no. And so we say, well, it wasn't effective. We need to try something else. But maybe what that what the goal is, maybe what the purpose is of that outreach is not about planting because you're not planting and watering good soil. The purpose of that was to break up hard ground. Right. And so some of us, what we have to do is we have to redefine the purposes of our outreach and our evangelistic ministries and events that we hold. Because some of them, the purpose is not to, to produce that harvest, that initial harvest. In other words, we're not going to present the gospel and no one is going to come to faith in Christ that moment. That is not the purpose. For some of us, the purpose is going to be to break up the ground. For some of our events, it's going to be to remove the rocks. For some of our events, it's going to be to pull the weeds. And for some of our events, it's going to be to plant, water, and nurture. Now, I hope we all remember that we do not grow anyone. We, we, give, we give people, we dig well so that people can drink from them. And I tell my congregation that sometimes we just need to dig so many wells and eventually they fall in one. <laughs> We cannot force them to drink. We cannot right. force them to eat. We cannot force them to grow. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can do that. Right. Exactly right. Yes. Well, you can talk about prayer another day. This is very important. I, don't, I want you to make it disconnected. We're, we're disconnected now. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> so I told you about the soccer. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, two other things that we've done. Breaking up ground is really about identifying hurts and wounds. Now sometimes we have to identify the hurts and wounds as, as, in, a, in a broader context. So we began to realize that there were some hurts and wounds in, our, in the larger context of our community. Some of them had been uh, inflicted by the, by the congregation who had gone before. And I don't think... I know those people well enough to know it wasn't intentional. They just didn't realize that the culture had moved so fast that they weren't keeping up. And so the, some of the things they were doing, uh, they're, they're still functioning with this mindset of, no, this is fertile soil, instead of the idea that this is hard ground. So one of the other things we did was 
was trick or treat. The fir first year that we were in our particular facility, like I said, we were in a literally in a neighborhood. So everybody walks by our, our doors to go house to house to go trick or treating, and we have this really long uh, drive that comes up. And this is definitely this was divine intervention. It was seventy degrees on Halloween. Mm -hmm. That it just never happens in Detroit. Let right. me just tell yeah, you. That's right. Uh, we are going to get sleet on a good day, <laughs> right, for Halloween. So it was 70 degrees, so we decided we'll do the, the, like, the actual trunk or treat, you know, where you decorate your trunks. And so we had all these cars lined up, and like, we're just going to give away candy bars. And my husband and I got the large size, because, like, okay, let's give away the, we're going to be, like, really awesome. We're going to give away the big size candy bar. And we had 200 candy bars specifically so that we could count how many we could go get. We can do. So we went through that in like the first hour. Um, we had over 200 kids plus their parents that came through. And we did leave the doors open so they could use the bathrooms. That kind of became the thing. We kind of became our restroom ministry. I don't know. It's, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> but we did remodeling. That was the first thing we did. Just let like, you know, we remodeled the bathrooms. Um, and we started having conversations with people. So that began to be one of the things to break up ground. And the next year was a regular, typical Halloween where it was sleeting. And so we said, I said, I don't want to be outside. <laughs> I lived a whiff. I'm like, I'm not standing out that, in that sleep. So we said, we're going to set up stations in the church. Now, some people were horrified. Um, you might be horrified too and might have to, I'm sorry, if I'm just giving you gray hair by telling you the story. But we had stations in the sanctuary, all right? So we had uh, a couple of stations and then throughout the building. And you have to see how our building is laid out to, to know how, how it works. Um, and we had coffee and donuts for the adults. Uh, and we, so everybody, we, just, we had somebody standing outside waving people in, and they came in. We, had, we actually had a pretty good turnout. We have now become, we are the potty break church on Halloween. And so people will come, and if it's bad weather, they're like, yes, the church is open today. And so they come in, and they'll hang out for a half hour with us and chat and have conversations. Some of those people, it's the only time of year we see them. And we come in, and we have these long conversations with them as if we haven't seen each other since the last family gathering. And they're, they're like, this is my church. <laughs> now, they have never been to a worship service. The only thing they have ever participated in is trick-or-treat. But they, in their mind, have said, this is my church. Sometimes uh, we're breaking up the hard ground. Taekwondo, uh, again, it was one of these things where 
we start we started doing Taekwondo at the rec center. And I told my husband, all right, I'll do this, but don't be telling a bunch of people that I'm a pastor here. Because people just get weird. Just get weird. It's so weird when you tell them you're a pastor. They're just like, they have all these preconceived ideas. Um, and so we started doing this ministry there. And then four months in, somebody ends up in the hospital. And my husband's like, she's a pastor. She'll go visit you. I'm like, but now it's all up. Now it's all up. Everybody knows. Uh, and so in, in that process, we, we moved this into uh, Detroit first. And so we had this ministry. We started with about seven of us and grew that ministry to about 70 people. And the ministry was just meeting felt needs. I mean, we, we babysat and we um, changed people's breaks, right? Um, we had people over for dinner. We played video games. And it was just about meeting felt needs. And there's a, a gal there, and she started coming. Someone had invited her because um, the kids were in daycare together. And so her son started coming, and he was like five. Uh, and she just started watching us, and she had all of these rocks that were in her life. She had grown up in the church, but she had left the church, and um, <coughs> she didn't have a whole lot of hope, except... In high school, her best friend was Westian. And her best friend had invited her to church, and she had this amazing experience. She said, I went to that church for six months, and she's like, I saw real Christians living like Jesus. She said it was one of the most amazing things ever. And she said, and then my mom said I couldn't go to that church anymore because they're not real Christians, like the Baptists. And so she made me stop going. So we got ready to plant uh, Debonair. She knew her Nazarene. She knew enough about the Nazarene church that we were in the Wesleyan part of the Christ, Christian tree. So she knew that it was similar to that. And she'd been watching our lives. And like Pastor Tim talked about, she'd been watching our lives for a year. And we were handing out flyers uh, to, to everybody saying, hey, we're going to start this church, blah, blah, blah. And she says, well, I don't want the cookies, but I'll take the flyer. There's, there's no way I ever thought she would. I knew her story. Mm -hmm. She showed up on that launch day, and as she walked out the door, she said, tell your wife, she said to my husband, tell your wife I play the flute. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, she had all of these rocks, and the first thing I said, I went to my worship leader, and I said, you're going to mentor somebody. You need to make room for a flute. Mm -hmm. She didn't trust me. She did not know the Lord. She was, ex we, we, you know, we call her Black Baxton. We call her Peyton. We call her whatever she wants. She was not a mentor of Jesus. I did not care. My job was to remove rocks. And so she was going to play the flute on the worship team. And I just watched that worship team just love on her and mentor her over the course of the year. Um, Janet and her son were baptized and came to faith in Christ, and she is now the treasurer of Devonair Community Church. Um, those faithful supporters, and she pays me too, which is really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, so, and this is all about felt needs. All about felt needs. Um, holy, now let's talk about holy needs. I'm going to dig up rocks, but we also need to pull weeds. Um, pulling weeds, Jesus tells us these are, the, these are the weeds and the thorns that grow up, and they begin to choke us out. And I really think about choking us out is really about a crisis uh, in people's lives. But in order for you and I to have permission to speak into crises, we have to have relationships with them. Right. Mm -hmm. We do not have permission to speak into people's lives who are in a crisis. If we do not have a relationship with them, we have not earned that right. Uh, in the early days, when we started our Taekwondo ministry, I realized it didn't take very long before I realized God was saying, you are now a missionary. You know that the United States is now, I think it's the second largest mission field in the entire world? All of you here are missionaries. And the only way we're going to minister to people and, and reach them is if we start thinking like missionaries. And 
that means we have to build relationships with people. Right. Now, Dr. Blake is very right. I am still an introvert. I was an introvert. I am still an introvert. Uh, I used to go home on Sundays. I like the, we talk about energy level, right? So the longer we went on Sundays, the more energy, like his energy level was going up. And by the time we got done with evening service, I was crawling out of the sanctuary. <laughs> like there's just not enough coffee in the world for this. Uh, Sundays, I was just, I mean, Mondays, I was just dragging. Mondays are still my day off. Um, and in the early days, we were playing at church. I would like, I'm like, I get up early, but I would be sleeping until 8. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Oh, yeah, I'm an introvert, and I'm doing all of the jobs now, not just my job, right? So you have to talk to all of the people. Um, and so but you have to build those relationships. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. You don't get the pass on building relationships with people. You just have to figure out how to do it using your energy level. We can talk about that whole other day. But you have to deal with pace. Find your pace. But you can still do it, and you don't get a pass. If you're going to speak in people's lives, you have to have that relationship. So I'm going to talk to you about Allison and Damien, and then we're going to I'm going to have you do some stuff before we take a break. We're still good. We're still good. All right. Uh, we, uh, Damien um, was part of our Taekwondo ministry also, and we're still we're still at Detroit first uh, and using that facility. Uh, Damien started coming and. One night we got uh, we got sidetracked because so we're all in the team room and we're playing video games and, and I don't know what we're doing, bowl, we bowling or something like that. And so he ended up getting home like an hour late from Taekwondo. And his wife says, where have you been? Taekwondo's been done for over an hour. She says, he says, well, he said they started playing video games in the team room. And uh, he says, I just got, I just lost track of time. And Allison says, you're lying. Nazarenes don't play video games. <laughs> <laughs> now, she had only had one experience with the Church of the Nazarene, and, and uh, it was with her mom, and she had, you know, she was in her early 60s or whatever, and, and so this was kind of her context. She, she didn't understand it, and so we had to, like, drag her into the church and say, no, really, we do have video games. She wasn't lying. Uh, and so we kind of started having this relationship with them, uh, and we have been already launched Devon Air, it's been a couple of years down the road, and Allison was pregnant with her second child, and she went into labor 12 weeks early. So immediately put her on bed rest, and I was down, I'm coming up to the hospital, I'm going to see you guys, I'm going to pray with you guys. And so when I walked in, um, you have to, because they're in a special area, right? And so you got to get a, a pass, and Said, I'm going to see Allison Lazarovich, and she said, how do you spell that? I said, L. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to call somebody on the phone, uh, and so uh, I quickly learned that if you really want to have uh, permission to speak into people's lives, you learn how to spell Lazarovich. <laughs> L-E-J-Z-O-R-O-W-I-C-Z, -E I think. C-W-I-C-Z. -C -C. Yes, I had to practice it a whole bunch of times. So it's one thing to know your name, but if you can spell it, you have just moved up on the permission ladder to speak into people's lives. Uh, and so I was able to go in there and minister to her and pray with her. And that night she went into, uh, she started going to shop and they had to take the baby early. So we took a picture of Hannah in her little incubator with all the wires and she had the mask on and um, we put it up on the big screen at church and I said our job today is to pull some weeds and this entire congregation is going to pray for this little girl named Hannah and we started praying for Hannah and people started taking meals to somebody they had never met couple people who knew them a little bit babysat so they could go down to the hospital and see their little girl and she was downtown Children's Hospital at this time and when she came from home from the hospital four months later everybody applauded and it would be almost a year before she would walk through the doors and Damien and Allison and Grace and Hannah and her entire family would come in and sit down and the first day that they walked in, 
everybody already knew their names. Damien is uh, an usher. Allison works in the nursery. Hannah just turned seven. <laughs> and she only has one speed, which is fast. Ben uh, and both help Mr. Rob usher on Sundays. Uh, and then this last Christmas, Damien said, I think the men's group should do something special for other people. What if we all go shopping and we buy Christmas presents for Pastor Corey's class, uh, which is an inner city church, or inner city school, um, and we be Santa for the day and minister to all of these kids. We have to be willing to pull the weeds. Because they were never going to trust Jesus Christ by me uh, just sitting down and talking to them about Jesus and handing them a Bible. We have to be willing to pull the weeds. And it takes time. It takes time. It took three years from the time we had that first encounter in the, in the youth room playing video games before they ever walked through our doors on Sunday morning. And then it would take two more years before they would ever give their lives to Christ and I would baptize. Five years. Are we willing to do the work it takes for five years for four people's lives to be radically transformed? Now we say, we say, right, that if we did it and only one person came to faith, it would be worth it. But then we maybe have different actions that don't measure up to what we say. Are you willing to do the work? Patience, patience, patience. Thank you. 